So she started her career in tech actually teaching other people to code uh, before she started to break out into, you know, doing it for, you know, money. <laughs> um, so she worked at a startup. She then moved on to work at Lonely Planet and then moved on to Zendesk where she is now. Um, she realised her main motivator in what she does is getting delight in the success of others, which turns out is a fantastic quality in a manager. Uh, if your manager doesn't feel that, go work for Adele. Um, she's obsessed with what makes people and herself tick and loves to hear how things she's getting things wrong so she can do better. She's an incurable optimist who believes one day we'll all we'll live in a world where everyone likes their job as much as she does. Um, but she isn't naive to think that's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> anyway, please welcome to the stage, Adele Smee. Good morning, everybody. I have this really annoying habit of wanting to be super chipper when confronted with a room full of developers that are uncaffeinated, but I'll try, and, I'll try and suppress it. Also, there's a ton of people I haven't said hello to yet that I know, and I don't know if this is cheating, but hello, it's lovely to see you. I hope we get to catch up later on today. Anyway, uh, let's get on with this. I don't think I need to introduce myself any further because that was a great introduction. So. Let's start talking about inclusiveness. And what I want to talk about today is how often this work is, it falls on the shoulders of quite a small number of people. And I think we might be moving the needle a bit faster if maybe a few more of us picked up just a little bit of that load. So let's talk about that. But first, I'm going to talk about what I'm not talking about. I'm not here today to convince you that diversity and inclusion are good things. Uh, changing people's minds is something that I think is largely a waste of time, so I'm not going to try and do that. Uh, so if you don't think they're good things, then please, I don't know where the Mario Kart is, or you know, jump on Twitter, Reddit, whatever your thing is, and we'll see you on the other side. I am quite hypocritical about this. I'm not particularly inclusive of people who are not inclusive. Yes, it's not logical, but that's where I'm at. So come and chat to me in the break if you want to talk about that. All right, let's move on. Uh, now, I'm talking about inclusiveness, which is kind of impossible, because I have a perspective, and that perspective automatically isn't inclusive because it's just my perspective. So I thought we'd just get out of the way who I am. Uh, I am a lady, a cis female. That means I was born, my sex when I was born was female, and I identify as female. I am white, as you can see. I'm a native English speaker in an English speaking, in English speaking country. That's the important bit. Um, I'm over 40. I don't have kids, which is not a typical female experience. And I'm a dog enthusiast. And this is my puppy, Sasha. And she's in all my talks. She's very cute. All right. Uh, so let's start with DNI. Let's talk a little bit about what that is. Diversity and inclusion. So uh, there's a common definition that go, that's going around that people seem to use quite a lot, although it has been criticized as being ableist, but diversity is being invited to the party, inclusivity is being asked to dance. Now, I would like to reframe that definition. For those of you that do know me, you know that I'm completely obsessed by food. So diversity is being invited to lunch, and inclusion is being able to enjoy the meal. And we're going to come back to this later. This is based on, on facts, this slide here. Uh, so, first thing I want to talk about is why I'm up here, why I'm motivated to come and talk at tech conferences about something that's not tech, because I really like software development. The first thing uh, that motivates me to be up here is, I think, as you all know, our lives are increasingly being controlled by technology in ways that are very convenient, but also a little bit creepy. And for the last several thousand years, the world has largely been steered by a fairly homogenous group of people, give or take the rise of the odd empire here and there. And that has led to some truly wonderful things. I'm a huge fan of antibiotics and anesthetics, but it's also meant that We've optimized for a very narrow band of priorities, and that means that a lot of things got left out, a lot of people left, got left out, or even got completely obliterated altogether. And if you look at, you'll see that, that left-hand photo there, that's a soap dispenser that doesn't work if your skin isn't light enough. And we've developed all this amazing communications technology where everybody's got a voice now, and so I think it's really, really important that we start listening. 
So that's one of my main motivators. Another motivator and another thing that gets me up here, I couldn't put a Hodor photo because it was it's still too, too soon. Uh, but let me take you back to 1989. I was in year eight in South Australia and I got my first taste of programming. I did a little bit of basic programming. Adele was here on the infinite scroll and I thought it was super cool. Now my dad was in the Air Force so we moved a lot. After year eight, I moved to Canberra in year nine and I went to a new school. And they said to me on my first day at school, what subjects would you like to do? And I said, I'd really like to do programming. I think it's super fun. And they said, oh no dear, you don't want to do programming, you want to do word processing. And as a result, I have a very fast typing speed but it took me 11 years to fluke my way back into this industry. And it really was a series of ridiculous events that mean that I am up here on this stage talking to you today. And look, maybe those people had good intentions. Maybe they thought that a girl new to this school wouldn't have a good time in a classroom full of boys because the class was all boys. Or maybe they thought my little girl brain would overheat if I tried to learn how to program computers. It doesn't matter what their intentions were. The effect was that I was excluded from doing this thing that actually turns out I really like. I love this industry. As I said, I really love my job. I've been well compensated for it. It's wonderful to be able to come here and talk to folks like you about stuff like this. And so because I've had that wonderful experience and because I got so lucky, I think it's critical that then I then hold the door for anyone else like me who might have been deliberately or otherwise excluded from joining us in doing this thing that we enjoy so much. And my last motivation uh, for doing this is it actually makes me quite good at my job. It's weird for me to stand up here and tell a room full of strangers that I'm good at my job, so I'm going to go to a Pulse review of, of one of my team wrote last year. I'm totally awesome, just ask me. Uh, but the thing is, I've been lucky enough to work in a series of amazing teams, and those teams had a couple of things in common. They were super resilient to change, and I think in this industry, as I'm sure you're all aware right now, the only real constant is change. What are we building today? Are we building that tomorrow? These are the business priorities now that they've completely changed. If we can't build teams of people that both really, really care about what they do and doing a great job on it, and can throw it away at, some, at a moment's notice and still stick together as a team and solve another set of, of hard, complex problems, then we're not going to last very long. And I'm sure all of you have examples of how you've seen that in your careers. Uh, and so, yeah. It makes me good at my job, that's a motivator. I think um, my perspective is not the only perspective in the industry. You might have seen this going around uh, last year. Peter Thiel, a very successful person, thinks that uh, diverse teams, what is it? Um, completely wrong, completely wrong. Make early teams as non-diverse as possible. Now look, I will admit that there is a context in which this is appropriate. If I had three weeks to build something and as soon as it was built and we'd shown it off and gotten funding or whatever it is we were aiming to do, we were going to throw that code away, absolutely, give me a non-diverse team, it doesn't really matter. But I work at Zendesk. I started there four and a half years ago and our goal then was to make a billion dollars in revenue by 2020. We're going to make a billion dollars this year or it's looking like we are. Uh, in 2020. And so after that, we, wanna, we now have our sights set on becoming a multi-billion dollar company. This is not throwaway code. These are not short-term uh, kind of wins that we're looking for at Zendesk. What we really want are teams that are resilient to change, that can evolve as the company is rapidly evolving. And when I see this kind of attitude, what I see here is fragility. I see a team that, yes, is probably optimized to do one thing really, really well. But over the course of time, when things change, what I see here is a team that's not going to see what's going to hit them and what's going to knock them over. Because this team is blind. This team might have very similar strengths and weaknesses, a very similar strength story, but it means it has very similar weaknesses. The teams that I've been lucky enough to work in have had a bunch of strengths and a bunch of weaknesses and a bunch of different perspectives that allow us to weather change when it happens. So that's that. All right. Let's get on to what I would have called this talk if I thought anybody would have come to it. I'm tired and I need your help. I'm going to talk a little bit about why I'm tired and then I'm going to talk a lot more about how you can help because that's a lot more interesting. So 
flash back to November last year. I'm at work. I'm in a meeting with a bunch of male managers. They're talking about something. Quite frankly, I have no idea what they're talking about because I'm on my phone not paying attention. Then when someone says the word diversity, everybody stops talking and turns to look at me. Now you're like Adele, you're a RubyConf on the stage talking about inclusivity. Of course they stopped and turned to look at you. You're clearly the person with all the answers. But this has been happening to me since my first year as my first student in, in TAFE, you know, whenever that was, many, many years ago. And I think it's an experience that's really quite common to those of us who and look, I don't know if I have an invisible sign on my butt that says I'm a diversity expert, but I have a feeling I might. And also I have a feeling that I'm not the only person in, in this room that has that sign on their butt. And it's really, really tiring when you're expected to be a very good software developer when I was earlier in my career, or a very good software development manager later in my career, and also, somehow, because of this invisible sign, I've become responsible for solving the systemic inequality in our industry. And it's really freaking tiring. I had a suspicion, and I'm going to try super hard not to speak for other people, but I can look around on the internet and so see what other people are doing. I had a sneaking suspicion that I might not be the only one in this position. And when I had a very brief look around, there are a lot of people out there who are experiencing varying levels of burnout or exhaustion because they're having this dual expectation put on them that not only are they going to be very good at this very complex, very fascinating thing that we do, but also have the answers and not just have the answers around diversity and inclusion, but also run the events and have the communications and give the talks. It is my dream that I come to this conference next year and there is a white male up here giving the diversity and inclusion talk. That would be super cool, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Anyway, there's a lot of people out there who seem to be facing similar levels of exhaustion. Go and look at some of these talks or articles. They're all people working in very different areas who have very different experiences from mine, and they're a lot more articulate about really describing the effect that it's had on themselves and their careers, especially that first talk. Being glue, if you're a manager, please watch it. It's super, super critical. The other reason I'm tired is uh, as was said in this gorgeous introduction, I've been leading software development teams working on innovation projects at Zendesk for the last four years. And now I've moved into a different role. I'm focusing on how to make engineering managers more effective. Because for those of you that have seen this or been affected by this, often the transition from writing code to managing people can be a rocky one. And we're going to try and make it smoother at Zendesk. But what that means is I've gone from a job where I was reacting constantly to lots of little bits of information every day to a job where I have to sit alone and think profound thoughts. And that's been really, really tricky for me. And one of the reasons that it's been really, really tricky for me is because these are the things that I was doing on the side in the other job that I'd kind of got more comfortable with just to kind of keep the DNI inclusion, you know, the work going. And this kind of work is interrupting, it's constant, the emails are always coming in, the slacks, the communication, the overhead of all of it. And I have strategies at work to try and hand this off to other people, but it's slow going. And quite frankly, most of the people I'm handing it off to are the people that have their signs on, on the butt like me. It's the same group of people all the time. So let's get into the more interesting bit, how you can help. Firstly, let's talk about what I mean by helping. This kind of helping is fantastic. It's great when I put the call out and I say, look, I need volunteers to help with this thing. Can you do that? That's really cool. And I encourage you to please keep doing that work. But the kind of help that I really want to talk about is this, where I get to be a passenger. I get to be in the back seat. I'm not doing the communication or the emotional load. I'm not carrying that load. I just get to show up. And you say, Adele, stand on that stage and talk about this topic for 15 minutes. And I do that. And then I go back to whatever it was I was doing before. So this is what I'm looking for. So how do you do this help? First thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need to motivate yourself. Now, how do you motivate yourself? I have no idea how you motivate yourself. I don't know you. I don't know what you care about. I don't know your context or your communities. I've told you how I've motivated myself, uh, and I encourage you to find your own motivations. This part of the step is crucial. 
because as has already been mentioned, I quite like computer programming, and I think you probably do too. And so for you to do this kind of work, which is a lot more nebulous, a lot more gray area than computer programming, you need to have a strong motivation, or when it gets hard, you're going to give up. So get out there and motivate yourself. The next thing I'm going to need you to do is educate yourself. Again, I want to emphasize, please don't call someone like me, someone with a sign on their butt, and say, Adele, tell me how to fix diversity for women in tech. I don't know that. There is no simple answer to that. And that, putting that load on me just makes me more tired. And as we've covered, I'm tired enough. So, Get out there and educate yourselves. I'll tell you how I educated myself, how I became a diversity expert. I'm definitely not a diversity expert. Um, I did it the same way I learned to code, right? I Googled some stuff, and I read some stuff, and I watched some videos, and I read some books and blog posts, and signed up for some newsletters that were talking about things in this area. I do want to point out, though, that if you're Googling, you know, how to iterate through a, um, you know, a hash in Ruby. There's probably, well, in Ruby, there's like 85 different answers for that. But still, there's a concrete set of answers. And depending on your requirements, you're good to go. With this kind of education, I encourage you to read a lot more widely. Please don't read a single tweet about a person's experience in a community and go, oh, I know all about this now. I can get out into the world. Really, what you're looking for here is to get a diverse range of experience uh, and a diverse range of opinions. Because when we're talking inclusivity, we're talking lots and lots of differences in how to cater for them. So let's have a look at. Um, a topic that I had a look at last year, uh, one of the things that I really got interested in. Now, I am female, we've covered that, uh, and I have a body and I live in current society, which means I've been told from the time I was little that my body doesn't look the way it's supposed to look, that there's some ideal and I am failing to live up to that ideal. So one of the communities that I was particularly interested in reading about was the fatness community. Now, even standing up here and using the word fat makes me super uncomfortable. But the, the people in this community are telling me that what they want to do is take that word back. We as a society have taken a word which used to mean something that was larger than something else. And we've evolved it to mean some sort of significant moral failure. And that's just uncool for so many reasons. So I'm going to try and use it. Now, let's start with Jamila Jamil. She's a gorgeous actress from The Good Place. She started a movement called I Weigh. And what I Weigh is trying to do is put people's worth not on the, the number on a scale, but on the complete picture of them as a person, the shiny things and the not so shiny things. And she practices an approach to body image and weight called body neutrality. Now, she is, as you can see, a slender person, so she doesn't experience some of the discrimination that other people do. And so she acknowledges herself that she has the privilege of being able to practice body neutrality. And what that is, is she basically treats her body as a thing that gets her from A to B and does body stuff. And as long as that's happening, she doesn't judge, well, at any point, she doesn't judge her body as a good body or a bad body, fat, thin. There's just no, there's no judgments that she puts on there. And then if we move on, we get to Megan Jane Crabb. Now, she's on Instagram as Body Posi Panda, and she is part of the fat positivity movement. And what the fat positivity movement is trying to do is it's trying to rewrite this narrative that we've all been force fed, and I think we are doing really well at achieving gender parity in this area, uh, that larger bodies are unattractive, that there's one kind of body for men and one kind of body for women, and we all have to aspire to that. So you'll find her on Instagram wearing not very much and dancing around and just being fabulous and gorgeous and attempting both for herself and for the rest of us to change that narrative that beautiful only comes in one size. And then lastly, we've got Sophie Hagen. She's a comedian out of Denmark. She's quite funny. I strongly recommend that you go listen to her stuff if you like to laugh. And she's part of the fat liberation movement. And what the fat lib liberation movement says is that we need to smash the capitalist machine that teaches all of us that we should hate the way we look, because then that means we go and buy more pills and potions and memberships and surgeries and all of the things that we do to try and achieve this completely unrealistic body ideal. And she's super cool. I really, yeah, I like the fat liberation movement. So you can see, even within a certain group, there are very different perspectives that are almost contradictory 
against each other, even though they're in the same movement. So what I want you to, to look for when you're educating yourself on a particular group is look for these contradictions, look for these different perspectives, look for humans whose context is different even though they might be put in the same bucket. Now, once you've educated yourself, you've got this academic knowledge and you're ready to get out into the world and help some actual humans, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to need to establish some trust and respect with the people that you're working with. Once again, I'm not here to tell you how to do that. This is a very particular thing, depending on you and the people that you're working with and what they need and who they are and who you are. What I will say though, is you don't have to become someone's best friend in order to, to establish trust and respect and openness. For example, I gave this talk at GopherCon last year and if you've been to any kind of Go events, they tend to be quite male heavy. Now GopherCon was aware of this and it made a particular effort to be inclusive. So when you went to the front page of the website, the, the conference website, the first sentence was, we want you to feel safe and included at this conference. Here is our code of conduct. Here are the different ways in which you can tell us if you're not feeling safe or included. Just by making that statement and then backing it up with you know, pronouns on lanyards and an amazing spread of food that covered so many dietary requirements. You have to back it up with your actions, but by stating your intention and then showing that you can be trusted, this kind of thing becomes a lot easier. All right, so once you've done that, what do you need to do? Well, you've established some trust and respect. Now you can ask people what they need. If you've established trust and respect, then they should hopefully feel like they can tell you. Great. But the next thing you need to do after that is you need to listen. And as much as possible, you need to listen with your own filter turned right down. To give you an example of this, I was lucky enough a couple of years ago to hire a team lead from India. She's one of the best hires I ever made. So grateful that she took a job at Zendesk. And we were talking when she first started, we'd you know, sit and have cups of tea and whatnot, and she would tell me about her working life in India. Now, I've never been to India, but I was listening to her with the white coddled Melbourne lady brain that I have, and she would tell me about her, the working conditions, and I would sit there going, oh my God, that's so terrible, that's so horrible, I can't believe you had to do that, I could never do that, blah, blah, blah. Now, she was kind enough and direct enough to actually say to me one day, Adele, I need you to know, I was really happy in that situation. I chose to be in that situation. That situation was really good for me for these reasons. And I realized that by listening with my filter turned all the way up, what I was doing was taking away her agency, was turning her into a victim when she absolutely was not one. She's a fantastic human being. So as much as you can, learn to listen without your filter. You'll get plenty of practice, I promise. Now, once you've done that, I need you to do something that's even harder. I need you to learn to pay attention. And here's what I mean by paying attention. So when I was 15, I got glandular fever, and that glandular fever turned into chronic fatigue syndrome. In my early 20s, I was bedridden. In my late 20s, I was getting out of bed. In my 30s, I was working, but I was very sick most of the time. And what this did to me psychologically is it instilled in me a great sense of shame and worthlessness. If people at work find out how sick I am, they're going to not promote me or not give me any good work or not give me any juicy problems to solve. I had this massive sense of baggage. And then I got a job at Zendesk. Some of you will know I got a job at Zendesk with a team of people. It was a big shiny job in a big shiny Silicon Valley company and we'd come in the door with this, in this big shiny way. They even wrote a, an article about us in the paper. And I start work on Monday and it's all cool. And then Tuesday, slightly less cool. By Wednesday, I drag myself home and I have to face the reality that I am not well enough to be at work. I'd had an operation six weeks before, a minor one. I was supposed to be fine. I was definitely not fine. So on my third day in my first week at my big shiny new tech job, I had to take six weeks off. Now, I nearly quit. Like walking back in the door at the end of those six weeks with all of this shame that I was carrying anyway from 20 years of being sick was almost impossible. But I somehow managed to talk myself into doing it, and I walked in just terrified about you know, what was going to come at me, and it's Zendesk, so they gave me a cake and a round of applause, which was very cool. 
Even better though, my boss, Brett, fantastic boss, was my boss for a couple of years. I was dreading, I was dreading the head tilt. For any of you who've been sick for extended periods of time, you know, the, are you okay? Are you all right? You know, I hated that stuff. I remember it so clearly. He came up to me, he said, you're okay? I said, yep. He said, cool, here are all the problems I have that are now your problems, go fix them. And he left. And I was like, oh, this might be okay. This might be okay. But even more importantly than that, over the next couple of years, when I would get sick, he would say to me over and over again, Adele, go home. Zendesk isn't going to go broke because you didn't show up to work today. Adele, go home. We'll get someone to cover speaking at that event for you. Adele, go home and rest. You're making everybody else sick. He had a big speech on presenteeism. He used to drop it down all the time. It was very cool. And the thing about that is, because I carried all this shame, I couldn't look him in the eye and say, Brett, what I need from you is to help me with this issue. But he was paying attention. He was watching. He was using his emotional intelligence to see what was going on with me and helping, just in tiny ways, to help me shift my own issues in this area. And the thing about this is not my story, but is that when you're working with communities of underrepresented people, when you're working with communities of people who are in the minority, they often will not be able to articulate to you in the same way that I could not what they need. And so sometimes you're going to have to pay attention. Maybe it's because they're carrying a bunch of shame like I was, but maybe they've just asked and asked and asked so many times and not gotten what they needed and so they've given up. So this part is particularly important. Beautiful, all right. The next thing you're gonna to need to do after you've learned to pay attention, no problem, is identify your blind spots or your filters, right? What things do you bring to your perspective on life and work that are getting in the way of you being able to hear what people really need? Again, a story for you. Uh, I was quite good at school. I was one of those annoying people that got very good grades without having to study very much. My little brother, not so much. He ended up dropping out of school early and was told from the get-go that he wasn't smart and wasn't capable. A few years ago, he decides to get into the tech industry. He wants to be a sysadmin. He's gonna be amazing. This dude has uh, the ability to troubleshoot problems greater than anybody I've ever met. And he would call me and we would talk about career advice and I would give him career advice. And then, because I can kind of sometimes pay attention when I'm smart enough, I was getting the feeling that my advice wasn't really hitting home, wasn't really getting there. And then I realized, of course it's not, because my advice is based on the ego inflated ego of a person who's been told their whole life that you can do anything, you're really smart, you're really capable. And I was giving that advice to someone who had been told his whole life that he wouldn't succeed, that he was a failure, and that he wasn't capable. So when I would say, just go talk to these people, or just send them an email, or just go to a meetup, he's looking at me like, what are you talking about? They're going to take one look at me and know I'm a fraud. So I had to adjust my advice there. Second thing I'll say about blind spots is even if you're in an underrepresented group, don't assume that you can speak for everybody's experience in that underrepresented group. I know I've already told this to you, but I had to learn it the hard way. So as we've covered, I was quite sick. Now on Monday, a friend of mine is coming to stay with me from Canberra, and she has multiple sclerosis. And I'm surprised we're still friends, because when she first got sick, I would say, oh yeah, I know what that's like. Oh yeah, I know what that's like. I don't know what that's like. I had chronic fatigue syndrome and I got over it. She has a degenerative disease of the nervous system. Her life is extremely different to what mine ever was. And the fact that I was creating this false equivalence just puts up barriers between her and myself. And again, I'm grateful that she's still my friend after me being just such a jerk about it. So identify your blind spots because they will form a barrier between you and your ability to effectively help. All right, so let's just cover this again. One, motivate yourself. I'm going to keep saying it. Without the motivation, you won't get through the other stuff. Educate yourself. Research. Learn to pay attention. Identify your blind spots. Once you've done all of that, here's the bit that really helps. Actually get out and do something. Now, yes, you can learn to public speak and come give talks like this, and I encourage you to, because I don't think I'm going to give them too much anymore. 
but also they can be tiny things. I was talking to a fellow about this last week and there was a woman on a team that he'd worked on. She was very introverted and she wasn't getting the opportunities that she should have because she was very quiet and she wasn't the norm. So she didn't look like the norm in that company. And so in meetings with management, he would make a point of put, putting her forward for opportunities, for things that were going to develop her career, for things that he knew she was ready and capable of doing, but not getting the chance to do. So this can run the whole spectrum. There are a million ways in which you can do this, which is why I'm trying not to be too prescriptive. But the point is you've got to get out there and take some action. Now, I have some really great news if you're a bit overwhelmed by all this. Women in tech is one of the things that I'm particularly interested in. So just talking about this one area, women enrolling in tertiary courses in, related to tech is dropping. We were just over 10% for a little while there. Now we're just under 10%. Uh, so we have a pipeline problem, and there's tons of great programs in that area that you could lend a hand to tomorrow without having to do too much extra work that need your help. Secondly, we have an inclusivity problem. Women in this industry are still leaving the industry two to three times more than the men. Accenture did a study in 2018 with the Women Who Code Global Organization, and they estimated that as of last year, there are about 24% women in the tech industry. Again, plenty of room for improvement there. They also estimated that by 2025, the percentage of women in the tech industry will be about 22%. So it's headed in the wrong direction. So we need your help. We need you to get out there. We need you to get involved. So great news, great news for everybody. All right, let's look at what this actually looks like in practice. Uh, here's an example from um, the project I was working on last year. I had three teams. There are about 30 people across a bunch of different areas. And again, I love food. So if you're working on one of my teams, the way we're going to celebrate or commiserate, or it's your birthday, or you've just arrived, or it's a Tuesday, is that we're going to have food. Maybe I'll do some baking. Maybe we'll go have a lunch. Maybe we'll do a potluck. This is how I strengthen the connective tissue of my teams. And that connective tissue is what allowed us to be resilient, to weather change, to weather a bit of chaos. However, what happens when you have these food allergies in your team? If you look at this and you try and picture the kind of cake that I could make that would suit all of these allergies, FODMAP, gluten-free, nut-free, nuts were always my go-to when I was dealing with gluten-free, then where do you even go from there, right? And so one of the things I want to make clear is that when you're doing this work, you'll probably never get it quite right. In fact, it might even be impossible to ever get it right. And I know you're a room of software developers and your currency in trade is getting things right. So, you know, I just want to plant this idea that maybe you won't get this right and maybe that's okay. It can also be super frustrating. The times I would be spending like an hour or two trying to book a restaurant where everybody was going to enjoy the meal, right? It was so frustrating and so annoying. And I'd be thinking, Zendesk isn't paying me to do this. But actually, Zendesk was paying me to do this because Zendesk needs me to create that strong connective tissue. I want to include these people. I want them to feel safe and appreciated. And so it's really, really important that I put in the time to do this work. But like I said, I often got it wrong. I remember there was one time I made a cake for one of the guys on my team. It was his birthday, and it was a sponge cake, you know, with the, the raspberries and the cream and all the layers. It was beautiful. Of course, he was very lactose intolerant. So I remember the look on his face when I went, happy birthday, and he was like, yeah, thanks. Not a great way to make someone feel included, right? And so it's really, really important. One of the skills you're going to have to develop, which makes failing OK, I promise, I promise, I promise, is the ability to apologize, to acknowledge that you screwed up, and to do it differently next time. So for this fella, I don't think I did a great job of the acknowledgement, by the way. I was chatting to someone a couple of weeks ago, and he's planted this seed in my head, so I'll share it with you, because I think it's cool. When you've screwed something up, when you've broken something, when you've made someone feel unsafe or unincluded, if you're acknowledging that, don't acknowledge that with yourself at the center. So what I probably did back then was a bit of, oh, I'm so sorry, oh, I really love cream, and I had this extra cream in the fridge, and so I made you a cake, and I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. What a much better acknowledgement would have been is, damn it, like your manager 
doesn't even remember that you can't eat lactose when half your conversations are about the fact that you love cheese and you can't eat cheese. That must make you feel really excluded. I'm very sorry that I did that to you. And then, and this I did do, the next cake I made was Nigella's uh, Nutella cake. It's very, very good and very easy to make lactose free. So I made him one of those and I put it on his desk and I said, you can do whatever you want with this. And I don't think he ate it all. I think he did share it with some of the other folks. But you know, this is the trick, right? It's really hard to do this work and get it right all the time. If you walk into this work thinking, yep, I'm going to be perfect at this. I promise you, you're going to disappoint other people and you're going to disappoint yourself. That's why step one, keep your motivation up. Really, really important. And then get better at the acknowledge, apologize, and really, really importantly, do things differently. If you don't do things differently the next time, all that trust and respect that you built up earlier will go away because people will think that you're performative, that you're empty words. Now, I would imagine that you find this quite scary. In fact, I would imagine that there's a group of people in this room who find this especially scary because we all live online to a greater or lesser degree and we've all seen the mob get their pitchforks and come for people, especially white male people, trying so hard to do this talk without that, that phrase, but there we go, it's my second time, um, for white male people who screw things up. There are two things I want to say to that that I know for sure, everything else I can't help you with. One, I know a lot of people, a lot of white males who are doing work in this area and who are smashing it. Also, without you, we're just all going to get tired and leave. So we need you, we need your help. And then secondly, something that I hope won't be a shock to too many of you, but that the real world is very, very different to the online world. Once you establish relationships based on respect and trust, if people can see that you're really, really trying, they are very kind and very appreciative even when you screw it up, especially if you get look good at the acknowledge, apologize, and do it differently next time. By the way, Jamila Jamil, the actress from The Good Place, her Twitter or Instagram, however you consume these things, is a really great example of someone who does screw up on a regular basis and is really good at saying, I have screwed up. There is no excuse for this. Please help me get better. These are the resources that I'm using, but if there's anything else that I need to fully understand you and your issues, please let me know. Now, as a final sweetener, if you're looking for one, uh, when you get good at this work, the more you do this work, the more you basically expand your emotional intelligence, because that's a lot of what we're talking about here, the more you focus on humans as a problem to be solved instead of just computers. They are fascinating, I promise, and they'll constantly surprise you. You will get very good at other things in your career the same way I did. You will get much better at pairing and teamwork because you will be getting better at hearing what people are actually saying to you and not what your filter is telling you that they're saying to you. You will get much better at winning tech debates. You will get your way more often because often, and I love refing tech debates, it's one of my favorite things to do as a manager, often people have a need that needs to be met. And that need has nothing to do with which tech stack we're going to choose to build this new thing in. It has to do with something emotional. I know you think you're all rational, but you're not. And so if you can hear that underlying need and you can meet that underlying need, then you get to get your way in all the other areas. And then lastly, you'll get much better at managing up. You'll get better partly because you will be a more well-rounded individual. And for those of you that are heading into the more senior technical roles, you'll be working out right about now that to be in a senior technical role, you actually need to be pretty good at people, not just good at technology. Good at technology is the lower level stuff, good at humans who make the technology, whether you're in management or you're on an individual contributor track, are the same. Um, and so you'll get better at being able to demonstrate to your managers, to people like me, that you should be promoted, that you're safe to be promoted, that you will also spread you know, your kindness and goodness amongst the team, which will create psychological safety, which means we'll be more resilient, which means we'll weather change better and better. So 
If you're sitting there and you're waiting for an invitation to do this work, this is, this, in, this is the invitation. I encourage you in ways big or small, when you're making your morning cup of coffee, crack open a blog post and read about someone whose experience day to day is very different to yours. Think about the people in your lives that might have had the doors closed on them and think about how much that makes you grumpy and think about what you might be able to do to help them. So I invite you to come and do this work those of us who are doing it, we're getting a little tired. I'm getting a little tired. Spoke for other people. Damn it. That's so close. I'm getting a little tired. I could use your help. So please come and join us. Help make the world a bit more of an inclusive place. Thank you.